So as Andreas is away today, um, I have the opportunity and great pleasure to introduce today's Wednesday seminar speaker. And it's not Mr., it's Dr. Alex Delbridge. And Alex did his honors and PhD with Andreas and completed this in 2013. And since Alex and I, basically we started at the same day in Andreas' lab, which was late 2008. And also, Alex had just only started his PhD. It was, I pretty quickly realized that this guy has a real talent for science, and he's really passionate about it. Um, I really enjoy talking, and most of you who know Alex, they will know that if you have a scientific problem, it's very good, actually, and great to talk to Alex about this. He's really good, and he has always great suggestions to our work, and I really appreciate this. Besides our professional um, relation, Alex and Mia also became very good friends. And we share another passion there, which are the Chilong cats. <laughs> Obviously, this wasn't so good this year, but Alex said next year we'll be fine again. <laughs> so Alex gave a great um, completion seminar in late 2012, where he presented parts of his other projects, which is a P53 independent DNA damage response. And some of that work was published in journals such as GND, Blood, CDD, just to name a few. Today, though, he will tell us about another exciting story, I believe. And I'm pretty sure we will see that soon in a very good journal published. So the title is Control of Hematopoietic Stem and Progenitor Cell Survival During Emergency Hematopoiesis. And now it's over to you, Alex. Oh, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we are. <laughs> um, I'll speak up until we've got it sorted. It's okay. Um, all right, well, thanks very much for that introduction, Marco. Um, so as Marco mentioned, um, today I'm going to be talking about a project that's been developing over the last couple of years. And we've been investigating, um, it's been a collaboration with me and Stephanie Grabo, and we've been investigating together the control of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell survival, and particularly looking during emergency hematopoiesis. And so the survival mechanisms that we've been investiga investigating have been mostly to do with the regulation of the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. And I've just illustrated the, the pathways towards apoptosis on this slide here. Um, so under conditions of stress, you have um, upregulation of uh, proapoptotic members of the BCL2 family of apoptotic regulators. And um, together, when the balance tips towards apoptosis, you get activation of the um, downstream proapoptotic mediators back and back. And they form a, uh, a disruption in the outer mitochondrial membrane. And that leads to cytochrome C release, which can then go on to participate in the formation of a scaffold upon which uh, caspase 9 is activated. And then caspase 9 then proceeds to activate the execution of caspases. And these are the, the workhorses of the apoptotic cascade. And they cleave a number of substrates within the cell. And then uh, that leads to cell death. Alternatively, in other circumstances, um, this pathway can also be activated by death receptor ligation. And that proceeds through caspase 8 and then also through the execution of caspases. But, for the purposes of my talk today, we'll be focusing on the BCL2 family up here. So in more detail, um, there are three factions of the BCL2 family, and together they interact physically to regulate uh, the initiation of apoptosis. And so the pro-survival members, um, and they share the most homology with BCL2, which is the prototypic member and the founding member of this family. And so these proteins promote cell survival by preventing activation of BACs and BAC, which, as I mentioned, are proapoptotic. But under conditions of stress, uh, members of the BH3-only subset of proteins, these, these proteins become activated, and they initiate apoptosis either through direct activation of BACs and BAC or indirectly through um, sequestering away the uh, BCL2-like proteins and preventing them from inactivating BACs and BAC. And so... Uh, when these interactions occur, um, then you can uh, regulate whether a cell lives or dies. So um, perhaps the most well-characterized role for these apoptotic family members in, in disease context is through the regulation of 
of uh, cancer development and cancer initiation. And it's long been established in the field that uh, resisting cell death is one of the key attributes of developing cancer cells. And it is one of the characteristics which they must attain in order to transform from a, a normal cell type into a fully malignant tumor. And when you think about um, the survival of the cancer cells themselves, obviously having sufficient uh, survival signaling and a block on cell death is critically important. But it's also uh, important in the context of the acquisition of the other attributes uh, that are required for transformation. So when you think about it in terms of the, clo um, the clonal evolution model of cancer development, these uh, attributes other than uh, resistance uh, to cell death are acquired through oncogenic events. Um, and they, these can occur um, in clones as they compete uh, to uh, reside within the formation, uh, the niche in which the tumor is forming. So each of these oncogenic events allows the, the developing tumor cells to acquire a new characteristic. Um, and this process most frequently requires the accumulation of mutations. And this in itself is a stress uh, imposed upon the developing tumor cells. And so it is very important that uh, there is sufficient survival signaling and, and there is expression of these pro-survival factors within these cells to prevent apoptosis uh, occurring and, and thus halting the, the development of the, the neoplasm. And so once these oncogenic events have all uh, occurred within the same cell, then you have expansion of that clone and that leads to the clinical features of malignancy. So one of the one of the great tools that's been uh, put to extremely w good use within the field to to investigate these questions and um, look into the nature of tumor development has been the use of the EMIC transgenic mouse model, and so this was developed by Jerry Adams and his colleagues a number of years ago now, and so this mouse was constructed by linking the MIC trans gene to the IGH gene enhancer EMU, and so this was constructed such as to mimic the translocation that occurs in uh, human Burkitt lymphoma. And so mice bearing these transgene have constitutive overexpression of MYC in, in, the, in the B cell lineage. And this is cause, causes abnormal rates of cycling and proliferation within the, the pro-B and pre-B cell compartment uh, uh, and <coughs> results in the accumulation of these cells. And this can be detected in multiple organs. And you can see here on this picture that it results in a huge accumulation of these cells. And when they become transformed, they, they uh, accumulate in the lymph nodes and, and result in this very characteristic uh, phenotype in the mice. And so this, this occurs once additional oncogenic mutations are acquired, and these cooperate with MYC, and, and they lead, as I said, to this clonal pre-B or surface IG positive lymphoma. So perhaps the most graphic illustration of the importance of apoptosis in this context is uh, this experiment here. So as I mentioned, um, the overexpression of MYC here, shown in red, uh, facilitates the, the rapid development of tumors. Um, but this can be augmented by overexpression of the pro-survival factor BCL2. So when you have overexpression of both MYC and BCL2, the development of tumors in these mice is even more rapid and, <coughs> and proceeds with a reduced onset. And this can be explained because of the ability of MYC not only to drive proliferation, but also to drive apoptosis. And when this occurs in concert with overexpression of BCL2, then BCL2 blunts this propensity to drive the cells to undergo apoptosis, and that, and that allows the cells to proliferate unchecked and then rapidly proceed and develop into a tumor. So while overexpression of uh, the BCL2 pro-survival proteins is obviously quite a potent way of driving oncogenesis, we, we also wanted to understand um, how the endogenous pro-survival signaling and how expression of endogenous pro-survival BCL2 family members, um, how they uh, facilitate the acquisition of these cooperating mutations and thereby um, play a critical role in tumor initiation. So the first uh, protein, BCL2 itself, was uh, the first one to be investigated in this context using the EMIMIC model. And so these... This was done by generating mice that are deficient for BCL2 and also, in addition, carry the EMIMIC transgene. And as you can see here, uh, when these mice were aged, you, the, the, uh, the median latency for tumor development is unchanged um, regardless of whether BCL2 is present or absent. Um, and so this quite clearly showed that BCL2 was not important for sustaining the developing tumor cells um, 
during the process of transformation and the acquisition of these cooperating mutations. So the next uh, gene to be investigated was uh, BCLXL. And in contrast, this provided quite striking evidence of the importance of BCLX during this process of tumor initiation. So as you can see here, and compared to the gray line of the control mice that uh, are proficient for BCLX, that when you delete BCLX, then you can, um, you can it, this results in a profound delay in tumor formation. And indeed, if you take these mice out even further, the, the difference between the two curves becomes even more apparent. Um, and this was shown a number of years ago, and I've replicated this in my most recent studies. But the novelty of the most recent studies was um, we showed that BC, the, most important of, um, the most important function of BCLX in this context is to counterbalance the pro-apoptotic uh, activity of BIM, one of the BH3 only proteins. And we were able to show that if you deleted, um, if we, if you deleted one or both alleles of BIM in the, concept, in the context of BCLX deficiency, you're able to rescue uh, tumor development in these mice and, and restore the, the onset to um, even a rate greater than that seen in the control mice. Um, so given the important role and the interplay between both the bh 3 only proteins and uh, the BCL2 pro-survival proteins, um, there was great interest from the uh, pharmaceutical industry to develop inhibitors that could modulate this system in the context of cancer. And the first of these compounds to be developed and used widely was ABT737. And this was developed by Abbott Laboratories and is designed to inhibit, uh, bind and inhibit BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW and neutralize their pro-survival function. So the development of this great tool allowed a number of new experiments to be done. And this is um, indicative of the type of um, studies that were conducted using this compound. And so this work done here at WeHi by Cass Vandenberg and Kylie Mason, they showed that um, if you transplanted mice with um, tumors uh, that were overexpressing MYC and BCL2, um, and then allowed these tumors to establish before treating the mice with ABT737, that inhibition of um, the pro-survival proteins with this compound uh, greatly augmented the survival of these mice and, and reduced the rate of relapse. Um, so clearly providing an indication that perhaps these compounds could be used to uh, prolong the, the survival of cancer patients. Uh, and this was perhaps even more evident in the, in the context of combination therapy. So um, this is a different tumor here, but also transplanted into recipient mice. And then the mice were either treated with ABT737 or with a commonly used anti-cancer therapeutic uh, cyclophosphamide. And so you can see in this particular tumor here, the, um, the activity of ABT737 and its ability to inhibit tumor growth is perhaps not as uh, compelling as in the previous slide. But when combined with cyclophosphamide, you can see here that it was able to completely prevent uh, tumor relapse in these mice. And this was um, the synergistic effect between both compounds was uh, quite marked and even greater than uh, that was achieved with either agent um, individually or even at a higher dose here in the case of cyclophosphamide. Um, so this provided a clear rationale for the, the use of these agents, um, perhaps as single, uh, a, a single agents for the treatment of cancer, but also in combination therapy. Um, what also became quickly evident from these studies was that um, ABT737 also induce, induces an on-target thrombocytopenia. And this was uh, rapid after the treatment of mice. You can see here that even only after two hours of following ABT737 treatment, there is a profound drop in platelet numbers within the, the treated mice. And this persists for at least out to 24 hours. Um, and so while this proved to be very useful during the clinical development of these compounds and provided uh, great evidence that the uh, drug was hitting the target and very important since this was a first-in-class compound. Um, but this did turn out to be the dose-limiting toxicity in the clinical development of these compounds. And so um, when the next generation of ph 3 mimetic drugs was developed, um, they were chemically engineered to have increased selectivity for BCL2 uh, rather than uh, binding both BCL2 and BCLXL. And by reducing the affinity for BCLXL, we were, they were able to reduce the antiplatelet activity of the compounds. And this culminated in the development of ABT199. 
Um, and so this is illustrated here with a little bit of data that I've pulled from this paper. Um, so you can see here that Navitoclax, which is the clinical analog of ABT737, you can see that in these red bars here that there is quite a profound reduction in platelets observed after, after treating patients with this drug. But when you compare that to the, uh, the thrombocytopenia or absence of thrombocytopenia induced by ABT199, you can see that the difference between the two compounds is easily apparent. And even at far greater doses, ABT199 does not induce the same level of platelet reduction that's uh, proved problematic for treating patients with nevitoclax. And the difference in uh, EC50s is also shown here, and you can see there's quite a profound difference between the, the first generation and second generation compounds. And so uh, this, these two compounds have proved uh, to be quite exciting in their clinical development and have opened up possibilities of new, new ways to treat um, particularly hematological malignancies in, in the case of uh, these two particular compounds for the treatment of CLL. But the fact remains that um, we're only targeting a small subset of the pro-survival uh, BCL2 family members. And so uh, we wanted to investigate a bit further to see if perhaps targeting the other members um, would be important um, in the context of limiting tumor development or um, perhaps it would allow us to, um, by studying these other pro-survival pr proteins, we might be able to gain further insights into the mechanisms behind tumor initiation and even the sustained gr growth of uh, tumor cells. So this data here was generated by Stephanie Grabo and um, it clearly shows that uh, probably contrary to our expectations that um, in addition to BCLX cell, uh, MCL1 seems to be very important uh, for tumor initiation in this immunic mouse model. So you can see here that loss of even a single allele of M MCL1 was sufficient to cause a profound delay in the rate of tumor onset in the immunic mice here. Uh, and work done uh, around the same time by Gemma Kelly has also shown that MCL1 is critical for the sustained growth of, of uh, immunic driven lymphomas. And so she was able to generate this data by um, generating a, a bank of tumor cell lines derived from tumors uh, bearing not only the immunic transgene, but also bearing flox deletes of MCL1 that can be inducibly deleted uh, following treatment of the mice with tamoxifen. So she generated these mice and then waited for tumors to develop established cell lines from the tumors. And then these were transplanted into um, recipient mice. And then after these had established, uh, tamoxifen was administered to these mice to delete MCL1. And then the mice were monitored for tumor regression or progression to assess the role of MCL1. And using this system, um, she was able to show that, uh, that MCL1 is critically important for the continued survival of these tumor cells. And the deletion of even a single allele of MCL1 was sufficient to prevent uh, prevent the mice from relapsing from these tumors. And this has not only restricted the EMU-MIC mouse model, work here done by Stefan Glaser has shown that there's a similar, similar phenomenon at play within uh, the growth of AML cells. And so he showed using MLL, ENL driven AML um, cancer that MCL1 is also critical for the sustained growth of these cells. So he did this by transplanting recipient mice, this time with AML cells, and then using again tamoxifen to induce deletion of MCL1. And he was able to show that uh, the deletion of MCL1 completely protected these recipient mice and prevented them from uh, suffering tumor relapse. Um, but in this context, um, deleting one allele of MCL1 was, didn't have that same potent uh, tumor static effect. So these exciting results um, clearly demonstrated the, MCL, the importance of MCL1 for the survival of certain cancers and raises the question of whether MCL1 can be efficiently, uh, effectively and efficiently targeted for the treatment of cancer. And, and perhaps this could be of uh, broader significance beyond their hematological cancers. Um, and this was perhaps exemplified by a relatively recent study that showed that the MC1 locus is amplified in approximately 10% of human cancers. And these included not only the hematological cancers, but also cancers um, of diverse different tissue origins. But the focus of uh, our work most recently and what the data I'm going to present to you today looks at, um, we were interested to, to try and mimic uh, therapeutic intervention and, and look at um, what potential likely complications uh, would occur in the context of MCL1 inhibition. And so we were hoping to identify 
um, expected on target biomarkers that would be indicative of MCO1 inhibitor activity, uh, and also to identify patient attributes that might predict uh, propensity to suffer to suffer the deleterious effects of MCO1 inhibition, and this would perhaps inform the clinical development of any MCO1 inhibitors that were developed. So we got a bit of a head start from the literature. There have been a number of uh, studies looking at um, the importance of MCO1 in different cell types, and the published data indicate there are key roles for MCO1 for the survival and function of a number of cell types, including developing neurons, cardiomyocytes, um, but especially cells within the hemopoietic system, such as B cells, T cells, myeloid cells, and also hemopoietic stem cells at, at steady state. Um, and so because of these findings and, and the clear importance of MCO1 within the hemopoietic system, we wondered um, whether we, we, we constructed a series of experiments to look at the extent of um, the dependence of the hemopoietic system on MCL1. And we wanted to look at particularly the context of um, stress and put the hemopoietic system under stress and see how much it relied on MCL1. And this was not something that really had been adequately addressed in the literature so far. So in the simplest possible way, I've just illustrated the um, hemopoietic system here, um, just to provide a little bit of context for the data I'm going to show you soon. Um, and so at the top of the, so at the top of the hemopoietic hierarchy, um, we have the hemopoietic stem cell, and this, um, these cells are able to self-renew and also differentiate to give rise to the multipotent progenitor cells. And these cells then uh, differentiate and divide and amplify this hemopoietic cascade and thus give rise to the, the number of different uh, mature blood cell types that we see in the, in, in the periphery of, of, of humans and of mice as well. And so uh, these are namely platelets, erythrocytes, neutrophils and monocytes, uh, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. And it's these three uh, groups here that I'll be particularly focusing on and presenting data about today. So the context which we're going to be looking at is emergency hematopoiesis, and this occurs when the mature cell pools are acutely depleted. And this is relevant in the context of chemotherapy and also uh, in the context of bone marrow transplantation. And also uh, throughout my talk, I'll refer to LSK cells, and this is, um, this is the population that encompasses the most primitive um, and uh, most primitive and multipotent members of this uh, blood cell producing system and it includes the HSCs and the multipotent progenitors. And these are defined as being negative for mature lineage markers, positive for SCAR1 and positive for CKIT, the stem cell receptor. So um, as I mentioned, we're interested to look specifically at the role of MCO1, but we also thought we'd um, have a look at the role of BCLXL given that uh, both of these proteins are particularly prominent in the hemopoietic system and have quite severe phenotypes uh, when they're deleted in certain contexts. So the BCLX deficient mice, uh, they're embryonic lethal and they die around E13 and a half because of abnormally increased cell death of erythroid and neuronal cells. Um, and even the more severe is the phenotype in the MCO1 deficient mice, and this is lethal at E3.5. E3 um, but uh, in both contexts, uh, mice heterozygous uh, for these uh, null alleles are, are viable and appear largely normal in both, both circumstances for both BCLX and MCO1. So for our studies, we decided to examine the importance of MCL1 and BCLXL during emergency hematopoiesis by utilizing these heterozygous mice. And we thought that this would provide quite a conservative estimate of um, a therapeutic targeting of either of these proteins, resulting in a, in a mild reduction in their levels. So we used a couple of what we thought were very robust models to investigate this. And, and these would give us a really strong functional readout of the importance of either of these uh, genes and, and the result of, of losing one copy, um, one allele of either of these genes. And so the first one um, is the chemotherapy model. And for this model, we treated mice with 5-FU, which is a, a fairly commonly used anti-cancer therapy, which is particularly used to treat um, gastrointestinal malignancies. And so this, this drug um, targets rapidly cycling cells uh, and kills them off. And so uh, we treated mice that were either wild type or heterozygous for BCLX or MCL1 with 5-FU. And then we, uh, we looked in the peripheral blood at a number of time points after treatment out to 21 days to look at uh, the effects of this drug and the ability of the mice to recover from this challenge. 
So I've shown here some data here for erythrocytes, but um, we, we had similar findings for different other blood parameters with slightly different kinetics. So you can see here that um, after treatment with 5-FU, the, the levels of erythrocytes decline in the blood of these animals, and they reach the kind of the, they bottom out and reach their nadir at about 10 days post-treatment. And then after that point, time point, they recover uh, and are restored back to their pretreatment levels after 21 days. And as I said, this, this also happens for, for platelets and for white blood cells as well with slightly different kinetics. But in all cases, um, hemostasis and, and uh, homeostatic conditions are restored after 21 days. Um, and, and as was expected and has been shown in the literature, wild-type mice, um, uh, they, they recover from this challenge quite well and we don't see any... Um, any loss of these animals over this time course. And the same was true for mice lacking one allele of BCLX. But we got a great surprise when we treated um, MCL1 heterozygous mice with this 5-FU compound. And we could see that they clearly didn't survive this challenge very well and were unable to cope with the, the stress placed on their hemopoietic system. And indeed, most of these mice uh, died, and they uh, died with a median survival of about 10 days. So when we looked in the blood of these sick MC1 heterozygous mice, we could see that the, the level of the anemia and, and the loss of red blood cells in this mice was more profound than that observed in the controls uh, at a comparable time point. And if we look over the time course, you can see that at multiple time points here uh, that the levels of red blood cells in these mice is far lower than, than is observed in the other control mice, the wild type or the BCLX heterozygous mice. And perhaps the most striking evidence was when we looked in the bone marrow of these animals. And you can see here that um, the level of hypercellularity observed in these 5-FU treated MCL1 heterozygous mice is, is far more profound than seen in the control mice, either wild type or, or those lacking one allele of BCLX. And, uh, so we decided to build on these results, um, and we looked um, at the ability of MC1 heterozygous mice to respond to a different, different stimulus. And in this case, uh, we did experiments using a sublethal dose of, dose of gamma radiation. So um, you can see here in black the wild-type mice, and you can see that the vast majority of these mice uh, survived this treatment quite well. But in contrast, when the MC1 heterozygous mice were treated with eight gray radiation, you can see that they, they rapidly died. Um, and the, in this case, they had a median survival of 11 days. And we saw a similar picture when we looked in the bone marrow of these mice as well. You can see that in the MC1 heterozygous mice that had been irradiated, they had a profound hypercellularity within the bone marrow. Uh, and this was in stark contrast to uh, that observed in wild-type mice at the same time point. So we then moved to expand our results by looking at a different model that was uh, designed to kind of recapitulate this, this stress on the hemopoietic system, but using a slightly different strategy. And so in these experiments, we uh, set up a competitive transplantation system. And we did this by harvesting test bone marrow cells that were Li5.2 positive uh, from wild-type BCLX heterozygous or MC1 heterozygous mice. And then we took these cells and we mixed them with wild-type competitor cells um, that were Li5.1 positive. And so we, by using this Li5.1 and 2 system, we were able to distinguish between the test cells and the competitor cells uh, using facts uh, with antibodies specific to these different congenic variants. And so we mixed these two different populations, test and competitor, in equal proportions to generate a one-to-one -one mix. And then each sample was injected into, uh, into three lethally irradiated recipients. These mice were then allowed to reconstitute over eight weeks, and then at, at, at the eight-week time point, we took blood for analysis. And then after a further eight weeks, at 16 weeks, we did a more thorough analysis looking at multiple hemopoietic organs. And at each analysis time point, we looked to, uh, to determine the level of test contribution within different cell populations. After 16 weeks, we also re-pooled the bone marrow from our three replicate recipients and then injected it into a further three recipients. And these were again allowed to reconstitute and we did analysis at eight and 16 weeks. So we had two rounds of reconstitution. The first one we referred to as R1 and the second one we referred to as R2. So I'm just going to show the blood data first. So when we looked in the blood of these, uh, of these reconstituted mice uh, that have received these mixtures of test and competitor cells, you can see that those that received test cells 
from wild type mice, these were able to generate reconstitution uh, at 50 50 ratio in the B cells, um, slightly less in the T cells, and, and also in the, the MAC1 positive population as well. In contrast, when we looked at the, um, the ability of test cells that were heterozygous for BCLX to compete with the wild type competitor cells, you can see that they're slightly less fit than the wild type cells and consistently produce slightly lower levels of contribution. However, when we looked at the MC1 heterozygous test cells, you can see that these, these cells were profoundly outcompeted by the wild type competitor cells. And this was fairly marked in the first round of reconstitution, but certainly uh, fairly acute in the second round of reconstitution. And these cells were almost completely absent in these, these secondary recipients. And this was consistent across these different cell types here. So, of course, one explanation of this could be that MCL1 is important for the development of these different lineage of cells and may involve activity in some lineage committed uh, progenitor cell, for instance. But um, what we thought was perhaps more likely was that there was a defect high up in the hierarchy. And so to examine this, we looked within the LSK compartment of these re competitively reconstituted mice. So as, I, as we saw in the blood, you can see that the wild type test cells compete efficiently with the wild type competitor cells, resulting in 50% reconstitution. Um, and the BCLX heterozygous cells are slightly less efficient than their wild type counterparts. But by far and away, the most uh, severe defect was observed in the MC1 heterozygous context. And these cells were almost completely outcompeted by the wild type competitor cells. And this is illustrated graphically here, and very similar to what we saw in the blood. So uh, as I said, we looked in multiple different organs, and you can see that across multiple different lineages here, the phenotype was very consistent. We saw that the, um, the MC1 heterozygous cells were substantially outcompeted by the wild-type competitor, competitor cells in the B cell lineage, the T cell lineage in, within the monocyte compartment, and also, as I've just shown you, within the LSK compartment. So we designed another experiment to, to look at this a little bit more in detail. And, and the deficiency that we observe in the ability of uh, MCL1 heterozygous cells to contribute to this reconstitution. So in this experiment, we harvested bone marrow cells from wild type or MCL1 heterozygous mice. And then we performed a serial dilution of these cells before we then injected them into lethally irradiated recipients here. So we then allowed these mice to reconstitute for eight weeks. And then we looked in the blood to see how well these transplanted cells had had contributed to the reconstitution of these recipient mice. And here's the wild type data. So you can see that in order to achieve a robust reconstitution of these recipient mice, we needed about a couple of hundred thousand cells. Uh, however, in stark contrast, uh, in the case of MC1 heterozygous bone marrow cells, we needed a far greater number in order to achieve that same level of reconstitution. And so it looks like we need at least maybe two million cells rather than the couple of hundred thousand. So that, that's a roughly tenfold difference, which is quite impressive. But of course, the first question you ask is, is this because there are abnormally low numbers of stem cells within these MC1 heterozygous mice? So we used facts to uh, determine the, the numbers of these cells within the MC1 heterozygous mice. And you can see here that the numbers we observed were very similar to what is seen in wild type mice or even in controls that were heterozygous for BCLX or BCL2. And so we saw no evidence that there was decreased numbers of LSKs or stem cells within these MC1 heterozygous mice. We also took this opportunity to confirm that loss of one allele of MC1 had indeed resulted in a reduction in MC1 protein levels. And we're able to confirm that using facts. So getting on the LSK population here. And then if we looked at MC1 levels by intracellular facts, you could see that they were consistency lower than the wild type mice. And I've just shown here some uh, staining done in MC1 knockout MEF to illustrate the differences we expected to see in our, in our staining strategy. We also. Uh, sorted out the LSK cells because we wanted to know whether perhaps the, the depth of response that we saw when we treated MC1 heterozygous mice with, um, with either fiber fuel or radiation was resulting in a more severe uh, death of the cells within the bone marrow. Um, so we decided we'd look at the sensitivity of MC1 heterozygous LSK cells by sorting them out, putting them in ex vivo culture, and then treating them with radiation. And as you can see here, um, that the MC1 heterozygous LSK cells are normally sensitive to gamma radiation induced apoptosis and they behave comparably to the wild type counterparts. 
So just to summarize what I've shown you so far, um, I've shown you that both alleles of MCL1 are required for recovery from 5-FU treatment, from recovery from sublethal irradiation, and for efficient hemopoietic reconstitution following transplantation. And I've also just shown you that um, loss of one allele of MCL1 does not sensitize LSK cells to gamma radiation induced apoptosis. So when we take all these findings together, um, this leads us to suspect that MCL1, but not BCLXL, is required to sustain the survival of proliferating stem and progenitor cells during hemopoietic repopulation. Um, so given the key role of MCL1 uh, within the the regulation of apoptosis in the BCL2 family. Uh, we wanted to know what, what is the key function of MCL1 in this context, and we suspect that it's, it's to inhibit the proapoptotic activity of the BH3 only proteins. And more specifically, we thought that perhaps BM and Puma were probably the prime candidates for being involved in this context, because uh, both of these proteins are important for cell death induced by cytokine withdrawal, ER stress, and cytoskeletal disruption. And these are processes that are likely to be relevant for rapidly cycling cells uh, and may be um, occurring during the, the acute repopulation phase immediately after these kind of myeloablative insults or during transplantation, for instance. And so we decided to um, use our models again and, and look at compound mutant mice. And so we generated mice that were heterozygous for MCL1 and lack either one or both alleles of BM or Puma. And so I've illustrated these guys here. And so again, like before, we mixed these cells one to one with wild type competitor cells and then used them, that mix, to reconstitute reconstitute lethally irradiated recipients and then analyze them after 8 and 16 weeks and performed a second round of reconstitution uh, to generate another data set as well. And again, we used the LI 5.12 system to distinguish between the test and competitor cells. And so, as you'd expect, um, in our control mice that were just lacking one or both alleles of BM or Puma, we could see that these cells were about able to robustly contribute to uh, repopulation. And you can see that consistent with their proapoptotic function, we saw an even enhanced contribution of these cells compared to the wild-type competitor cells. And again here, I've just, just to remind you how severe the defect was in the MC1 heterozygous context, you can see here that these cells are um, substantially outcompeted by the wild-type competitor cells and they only contribute a very small proportion of, of the cells within this LSK compartment of the recipient mice. So when we deleted BIM, we could see that a loss of BIM provided a minor rescue in this context. And you could see that um, it was clear that these cells were contributing slightly better than the, than the MCL1 heterozygous cells. Um, but by far and away, the much greater rescue was observed in the absence of Puma. And you can see here that uh, when, compute, when the cells are completely deficient for Puma, they can contribute uh, very substantially uh, to the repopulation within this LSK compartment and perhaps even greater than was observed even in the wild type scenario. And perhaps more compellingly was that this, uh, this rescue that was afforded to the MC1 heterozygous cells by loss of puma was durable over both rounds of reconstitution, R1 and R2. And this was in contrast to the rescue that we observed in under conditions of BIM deficiency, and this was lost after the second in the second round of reconstitution. So it seems very clear that Puma is the most important BH3 and new protein in this context. Um, so we decided to have a look to see that whether this would hold true in our chemotherapy model as well. And so we generated mice that were def uh, heterozygous for MCL1 and deficient for either BIM or Puma. And then we treated these mice in the same manner as we had done previously with 5-FU and then looked in the blood to see, to see the, to determine the ability of these mice to withstand the challenge um, imposed by 5-FU treatment. So, I mean, as I'm sure you'll recall, the MCL1 heterozygous mice are um, deficient in their ability to withstand the del deleterious effects of 5-FU and display a profound sensitivity to 5-FU. So when we, uh, when we treated mice that were heterozygous for MCL1 and had lost BIM, you could see that there was quite a substantial rescue and that the majority of these mice survived the entire duration of this experiment. And the effect of PUMA was even more marked. And you could see that 100% of these mice uh, that had 
lost Puma in the context of MC1 heterozygotes that he survived the entire duration of this experiment, illustrating the importance of Puma in this context. So just to summarize these rescue experiments, um, I've shown you that uh, loss of Puma rescues the repopulation defects observed when one allele of MCL1 is lost in the context of 5-FU treatment and also in the context of competitive reconstitution. And I've also shown you that loss of BIM appears to only play a minor role and can only confer a minor rescue in this context. And so to conclude, it seems that the key role of MCL1 is that it is required to block stress-induced puma-mediated apoptosis during hemopoietic repopulation. So as I alluded to in my introduction, that MC1 has already been shown to play an important role in HSC survival at steady state. And these experiments were done in the absence of other stresses in contrast to the experiments I've just shown you. And I've just cherry-picked a bit of data out of here to out of this paper to show that here in the light blue bars that when you acutely delete MCL1 in adult mice at steady state, that you can see that there is a profound drop in the numbers of HSE cells here in contrast to the control mice here. So we wondered, given the critical role uh, we had uncovered for Puma during emergency hematopoiesis, we were wondering whether um, loss of Puma or maybe even loss of BIM might protect mice from the deleterious effects of acute MCL1 loss uh, within the HSC compartment. And so to address this question, uh, we harvested test bone marrow cells from mice bearing a tamoxifen-inducible Cree or bearing the Cree in addition to MC1 flox alleles or MC1 flox alleles plus um, a puma null allele or two puma null alleles or two BIM null alleles. And so these, these cells were harvested from the bone marrow of these mice and then they were used to reconstitute lethally irradiated recipient mice and we waited eight weeks to let them reconstitute, and then we treated them with tamoxifen to induce deletion of MCL1, and then we looked at their ability to withstand this acute deletion of MCL1. So consistent with the published data, we were able to show that um, acute deletion of MCL1 in adult mice results in a rapid bone marrow failure phenotype, and you can see here that the vast majority of the mice died quickly, and uh, had a median survival of about a week. And this was in contrast to mice bearing the Cree alone, or the Cree plus uh, an absence of, of Puma. So uh, we first looked to see if BIM could rescue this, uh, this bone marrow phenotype, and when we looked at the survival of mice that had acute deletion of MCL1 in the absence of BIM, you could see that we provided a, a small degree of rescue here, and, and greater than, slightly greater than 50% of these mice survived the duration of our experiment out to one month. But we saw an even more marked effect when we looked at mice um, that were deficient for Puma after acute deletion of MCL1. And you can see here that these mice just survived even better than those lacking BIM, um, but we didn't see any effect for those lacking only one allele of Puma. So to gain further insight into what was happening at a cellular level, um, we again turned to our competitive reconstitution system and, and modified that to look at um, the role of MCL1 in this acute deletion scenario. And so we harvested um, test bone marrow cells from the genotypes I just told you about. Uh, they all had flocks alleles of MCL1 that could be acute de acutely deleted with tamoxifen and then uh, they also had a deficiency for PUM or BIM. And so these were mixed one-to-one -one with competitor, wild-type competitor cells and then these mixtures were used to reconstitute lethally irradiated recipients. And then after eight weeks to allow them to fully reconstitute, we treated with tamoxifen. And then we waited a further one month and then analyzed the ability of these test cells to contribute uh, within different hemopoietic subsets. So what we saw was actually quite surprising. We saw that regardless of the presence or absence of BIM or Puma, that in the blood, uh, acute deletion of MCL1 resulted in a near absence of these test-derived cells. Um, and so these cells were almost completely outcompeted um, by the wild-type competitor cells. And in the LS case compartment, we saw a slightly, uh, we saw a, perhaps a very marginal rescue in the case of puma deficiency, but the, uh, the results we saw here when we looked at these one-to-one -one reconstitutions was uh, far less dramatic than the phenotype we saw when we looked at the overall survival of the fully reconstituted mice. 
And so I'm just going to show that data again uh, just to illustrate what we think is going on here. So we think that perhaps the loss of tumour is allowing the mice to, to get through this initial window of MCL1 deletion and it allows the survival of the proliferating progenitor cells to generate just enough mature cells to keep the mice alive. But in the long run, these cells and the HSCs are completely outcompeted by any of the residual um, wild type or even the recipient derived wild type HSCs and these are able to expand and then completely push out any of the MCO1 deficient cells. And so we think that explains why we see slightly uh, different results in the two different systems. So to bring everything together, we'll uh, put up this very simple model. So after blood cell loss, um, acute loss of mature blood cell types, we have um, the initiation of proliferation signals that leads to stem cell mobilization within the bone marrow. And this facilitates blood cell production, but also um, institutes a replicative stress on these proliferating cells. And we feel that the the key role of MCL1 in this context is to counterbalance this stress, which is mediated through Puma and also perhaps a little bit through BIM. And so the activity of MCL1 is critical to uh, counterbalance this stress and allow blood cell production to uh, proceed efficiently and allow homeostasis to be restored uh, in these mice. And so I've just got a couple of points here that I'd like you to take away from my talk. And so hopefully I've managed to convince you that MCL1 is critical for the survival of cycling stem and progenitor cells, and that its key function in this context is to prevent puma-mediated apoptosis. And so this, these findings lead us to, to suggest that perhaps uh, patients with signs of hemopoietic insufficiency may be unduly susceptible to side effects of drug-mediated MCO1 inhibition. So we would urge caution perhaps in this context. Um, but on the flip side, uh, perhaps the, if we can develop strategies or drugs that stabilize MCO1 or, on, or alternatively block PUMA, we might be able to enhance the efficiency of bone marrow transplantation. So that brings me to the end of my talk, and I'd just like to make a few acknowledgements. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this, this project was done in collaboration with Stephanie Grabo, and we worked together on this project, and equally it could be her up, up here standing here and presenting this data to you. This work was done in the lab of Andreas Strausser, and he provided advice and, and guidance at key points throughout the project, and Joe Offerman, uh, who works out of St. Jude's in Memphis, um, was kind enough to contribute the uh, whole body irradiation data to our to our publication that's in submission at the moment. Um, Daniel Gray, Brandon, uh, particularly, has provided clinical insights into our interpretation of our data. And Marco have also been all been supportive at different points. Uh, I'd like to thank the whole Strasser Lab. It's been a, a great place to, to do research, and, and I think we all have a great time bouncing ideas off each other. Um, there's been a lot of mice used in this study, and the genotyping was done by Bruno and Carly. Uh, Ashley and Ben provided advice about our experimental setups. Jason ran huge numbers of bleeds for this project. And we also uh, made good use of the core facilities here at WeHi that make everything so easy. Um, the flow cytometry group, um, histology, and also bioservices. And we've had a number of uh, expert animal technicians that have, um, it wouldn't have been possible to do these experiments without their help. And funding's been provided by these different organizations. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for a really great talk and questions, by Great. So you showed that obviously knockout of BIM or Puma alone wasn't sufficient to rescue in your competitive assays. Do you think that if you knocked out both, you would see a rescue, or does your data support this potential non-apoptotic um, mitochondrial role eventually? Um, I think it is certainly a, a survival phenotype, and I think you're quite right. I think if we generated mice that were deficient for both BIM and Puma, we would see, um, see the resistance augmented. Um, we did generate mice that were heterozygous for both BCLX and MCL1, and we did see a, a, a greater deficiency in that context, so I think that provides some rationale for, for a combinatorial role of the different um, proteins together. Nick? Yeah, Alex, I'm interested in... Uh this stress that you're talking about, the replicative stress versus potential um, survival, um, I guess, advantage of wild type versus MCL1. So when you irradiate the mouse, there's a loss of cells, and there's also a production of growth factors. Um, but the loss of cells can also make a, a niche or make it more competitive for wild type cells to maybe preferentially survive. 
first of them spell one from Zygon. So do you know in culture, for example, if you were to take Alice Case and do 50-50 cultures in, in titrations of stem cell factors, if they would actually survive better, the wild types would actually survive better, or is it purely a replicative stress versus a survival event? Um, yeah, that's a very good idea. We haven't we haven't done a competitive scenario in vitro, but um, when we were doing those uh, ex vivo radiation experiments, we did culture the MC1 heterozygous cells, and they seemed to grow quite normally. Um, but I mean, in order to reveal a subtle difference, you, you would, as you suggest, have to do a competitive experiment. Perhaps that's something we need to consider. Ashley, thanks. So that's very interesting data. In your um, rescue experiments, did the BIM heterozygous mice have a superior uh, ability to rescue than the homozygous in one of your slides that you showed? Um, oh, so in that second round of reconstitution, yeah, yeah. yeah so it seems to be more durable. Um, and we're not quite sure what that, what's, what's causing that effect. Um, if we were going to hand wave, we'd probably suggest that... Um, that while BIM is rescuing in that first round of reconstitution that there is an accumulation of damage to those cells and that means that they're less fit in the second reconstitution. But, um, and, and perhaps that effect is slightly mitigated and the, the most damaged cells are still eliminated when you've only lost one allele of BIM. But really that's, that's a bit of hand waving and, and we're not really sure what's going on in that, in that situation. Very interesting talk, Alex. Do you think uh, Puma might be the main mediator of the stress that causes uh, a P53 mediated response? Yeah, so there is some literature to suggest that loss of P53 also enhances um, the ability of um, HSCs to compete in, in a similar type of scenario. And, and we've had a number of discussions with our colleagues, particularly Brandon, who's interested in in the regulation of P53 and, and its role in different contexts. So, yeah, perhaps it is it is related to its ability to um, respond as a P53 target, and maybe some of the stress signals are mediated through P53. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's quite a good good comment. In the same context, Alex, have you looked for Noxa? You think? No, we haven't. We haven't done any experiments with Noxa. Um, it seems like the role of Noxa as a P53 target is perhaps not nowhere near as important as Puma in, in the hemophilic system, but maybe in other cell types it might be more relevant. Um, did you use concentration of 5FU that are used uh, in combination, your 150 mg? Oh, so... Um, did you titrate it down to see the effect of loss of MCL1 when you have lower concentration of 5FU? Uh, no, so we just we we only used the one dose in our experiments, and uh, I actually got that experimental strategy from Ben Croker, and it was what he the dose he suggested to give them a strong hit, but not over, completely overwhelm the mice. Um, so maybe in a clinical context, you might want to use a different dose. Questions? If not, then uh, please join me in thanking Alex for.